Hey South Hills, this month, November, is considered Foster Care Awareness Month. On any given day, there are nearly 437,000 children in foster care in the United States. This is one of the reasons why we are honored and excited to be partnering with an incredible organization during this month. Olive Crest is an amazing organization that is dedicated to preventing child abuse by strengthening, equipping, and restoring children and families in crisis one life at a time. They care for entire families by offering support and services like preventative care, fostering, adoption, assistance for young adults, and so much more. You may not know this about me, but bringing awareness to foster children is really close to my heart. And the reason why is because this is the avenue and the road that God allowed me to become a dad. When my wife and I decided to start having children, we assumed that we were gonna have children like most people do. And for some reason, that was not the avenue that God had in mind for us. As we started to attempt to have children, year after year, we had come across challenges of not being able to. And as we consulted with doctors, we came to realize that there was no reason for us to not be able to have children. But at the end of the day, it wasn't God's plan. And so sure enough, as we looked at all the different avenues, we decided to go down the road of foster adoption. And we came across an amazing opportunity for us to be blessed with amazing children that we absolutely love and adore and that could not be better children for us. It has been the greatest joy of my heart to be able to be a father, to be able to raise children, to be able to provide a home for them, to be able to allow God to speak into their hearts and see their gifts and their passions be explored, to be able to live a life that God has called them to. As we have gone down this journey, so many people have looked at us and said, man, what an amazing opportunity you've provided for those kids. And I say, you got it all wrong. Those kids have changed my life and allowed me to be a father that God had called me to be. Were their lives changed? Absolutely. But my life was changed in this process. And I'm excited to see what next story is going to be coming out of our South Hills Church, where someone sitting in a seat today is going to open up a prayer and open up their heart and say, God, is this the road you have for me? Is this the journey that you have in store for me to be able to be a father or a mother or to have a family? Or God, are you simply just asking me to be involved with this organization? Whatever the journey is for you, I'm just asking for you today to consider what can you do to make a difference inside the lives of these children? And I'm excited to see how God will use us as a church, as individuals to make a difference in the lives of the kids and families in our communities. I said this, my name is Chris, I'm the campus pastor at South Hills here in Costa Mesa, and we are starting a new series today called Blessed. And when we hear this word blessed, there's a lot of different ideas that come to mind, different words, different pictures, different images come to mind, um, and it kind of conjures up different feelings for us as well, because uh, depending on what we think of when we hear that word blessed, um, there's a thousand different ways to define it. When I say that word, some of you guys probably go straight to money which isn't helped by the fact that we still spelled blessed using dollar bills. Uh, so um, some of us think about money and, and having a lot of it uh, or having more than we currently have maybe is, maybe that's the marker of what it means to be blessed. Some of us think about uh, the grace that God has shown us. If you're a super spiritual person, maybe you're like, you know what? I am blessed because of God's grace. And that's true. Uh, some of us, we think about things like generosity and I have time or I have resources or I have skills or abilities and, and you know, I'm really good at putting together tool sheds. And so I'm going to show up for Chris next Saturday and help him put this thing together. And, and so there's different ways that we kind of think of this idea as uh, or the idea of being blessed. And it makes me think a little bit of the movie The Princess Bride, where if you guys are familiar, okay. <laughs> I like it too, but I mean, geez. Uh, but uh, there's a scene in the movie where uh, one character continues using this word inconceivable over and over and over and over again. Inconceivable. That's exactly right, Wes. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Andre the Giant, who is a phenomenal actor, it turns out. 
just kidding. Um, but he says at one point, he's like, you keep on using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And, uh, and I think that might be true of us with this word blessed. I don't know if it means what we think it means. I don't know if the thoughts that we have, the images that come to mind, I don't know how accurate they are to the meaning of the word blessed. Um, whenever we write uh, sermons or prepare series, we always use different resources because uh, every single one of us is learning. And so we're taking information and we're learning from different authors and pastors and theologians and counselors and all kinds of different things. And there's a pastor named Mark Batterson in Washington, D.C. He's written a few books as well. And he has this quote about what is, what is blessing? What does blessed mean? And it's just such a powerful quote because I think it gives us a little bit of uh, elbow room to kind of come up with some new ideas. He said, the blessing of God isn't easy to quantify or qualify. It is tangible and intangible, timely and timeless. It's universally offered to everyone, but the blessing of God is as unique as your fingerprint. Some blessings are as simple and straightforward as the sunrise. Others are more difficult to discern, like the blessing of brokenness. But of this, I'm certain the blessing of God is the solution to your biggest problem, the answer to your boldest prayer, and the fulfillment of your bravest dream. And I I like this quote, again, because it just, it gets us out of maybe whatever the bucket is that we automatically go to when we think about this idea of blessing. It's, you know what, it is... It is bigger than me, and it is tangible, and sometimes it does show up in having enough, whatever that looks like in your life. And sometimes it shows up in feeling like I have enough. And those are very different things. And, and so you could slice this pie a thousand different ways, and believe me, I love pie, uh, and I prefer big slices. But there's this important thing for us to, to process through what this looks like. But I think most of us, if we were just to kind of be asked the question, I think that we would define being blessed as getting what you want and having more than you need. I mean, that's kind of the, the base, kind of most crass way. <laughs> we, I don't know that anybody would be like, yeah, this is my definition of blessing. But if you really boiled it down, it's, it's getting what I want and having more than I need. It's I, I, I get the things that I want. I want the shoes or I want the car or I want the house and I'm able to get those things. So I'm blessed. Or maybe it's a a sense of having more than enough, more than you actually need. And and I I don't know that this is accurate, but it comes from, I think, there's some scriptures that really kind of reinforce this idea. One is in James. It says, every good and perfect gift, every good thing in our lives comes from God, the Father of heavenly lights. And so there's this idea, and it is true that all of the good things that we have in life, from your fancy new Nikes to your car to whatever it might be, we have those things because um, God in some way has helped us experience those things or get those things. God has blessed us in some ways. But is that it? Is it just that if you have something good, it's a blessing from God? If you look around your life and, and you have all of the good things that money can buy or all the things that you want, does that mean that you are blessed? And maybe the question even is, do you, does that mean that you, you feel blessed? The other way to slice this question, if you were to kind of reverse it, is if you look around your life and you don't have all of the good things money can buy, does that mean that you are not blessed? If you're here and and you find yourself making it (laughs) and it feels like a win every time you get to the end of a month and you made it another month, does that mean that you are not blessed because you don't have excess? because you don't have all of the stuff that you want or all the stuff that you desire? Is there something that's keeping you from being blessed? I I think it's a a broken definition when we expect that blessing means getting what we want and having more than we need. Even in Jesus' life, this was a common kind of misconception and misunderstanding. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 19 I want to look at just to kind of help us realize the, the scope of this conversation. In Matthew 19, a man comes up to Jesus, and the scripture refers to him as the rich young ruler, which if you're not going to get your name printed in the Bible, at least you get like an awesome title given to you, right? So the rich young ruler, in verse 16, it says, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, when we hear the word eternal life, if you've grown up 
uh, sometime in the last 75, 100 years, you probably are picturing like pearly gates and golden streets and mansions and the place you go to after you die. But that wasn't really a concept that people in this first century were really, that wasn't what they meant. It really had more to do with a whole life or a full life. It was more about the life that they were living now, experiencing the goodness and fullness and blessing of this life than it was about where they were going to go when they died. So he says, what must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replies, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Well, which ones? He inquired. And Jesus replied, you shall not murder You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And there's a sense where this guy is talking to Jesus, and and there's kind of the sense of, man, I have everything. Uh, I'm called the rich young ruler. I have power, I have wealth, I have Uh, age on my side. I mean, all the major categories, he's got it. And there's this sense where he's still trying to figure out, how do I solve this piece that's missing? I have so much, and yet there's still something that I feel like I'm missing out on. There's some aspect of life, life to the full, or being or feeling blessed that somehow I'm, I'm missing this thing. Jesus answers in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. There's this interesting piece that it's not new to any of us. And this idea isn't going to blow anybody's minds, but having stuff, having money, having wealth, having power, does not actually give us what we are most longing for. It does not guarantee that you will feel fulfilled or whole or even blessed if we want to keep using that word. And we've heard celebrities talk about this and they always say like, well, just because I have everything doesn't mean that everything in my life is great. But they always say that when they're on a red carpet, you know, so it's like kind of hard to believe sometimes. (laughs) But Jim Carrey, I think, is maybe one of the more famous ones where he said, "I I wish that everybody was able to have all of the money so they could buy themselves all the things that they ever wanted and also realize that it does not give them what they need to be fulfilled. It's very clear about this idea. And so whether it's celebrities that we're talking about, whether it's maybe people in your own life, you may know people, you may look at people, and you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever looked at somebody and been like, you know what, if I had what they had, I'd be a lot more grateful. <laughs> Uh, If I had what they had, I would recognize that God has blessed me. They're like a little bit grouchy. They're a little stingy. It seems like they only want more. But there's a sense of we're always looking at something else or someone else. And and there's people in our lives that are wrestling with this idea of I, I have enough, but I don't necessarily feel fulfilled, whole, blessed. Celebrities, people in our lives, this man that came up and spoke with Jesus, It's not about how he gets to heaven later, but how he experiences fulfillment or recognizes the blessing that he has in the here and now. I think that many of us are convinced by this idea that if I had what they had, I'd feel blessed. And the problem with this is that there's always going to be somebody that has more than what you have. There's always going to be another another level, another step, another dollar amount or tax bracket or whatever, however you want to slice it. You know, maybe it's about relationships. You know, if I had a spouse, then I would feel blessed. Or if I had kids or if I had, you know, success or this, whatever it might be, there's always this kind of, this broken kind of reality that we find ourselves spinning in times. It's like, man, once I get here, then I'll feel this certain way. But if you cannot feel it here, where you are at, you will never experience it there either because things cannot help you experience what it truly means to be blessed. Living blessed isn't about how much you have. It's about how you view and what you do with what you have. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of recognizing what it is that I have and what is it that I'm going to do with what I have. And it's not tied to a number 
or a dollar amount or a passion or a skill or an age or a position as we see from this rich young ruler. Jesus told another parable about this um, later on in Matthew chapter 25, it kind of illustrates this idea of how we view and what we do with the things that we have. Um, parables are stories, they're kind of fictional stories that Jesus would tell to illustrate a bigger point. And uh, in Matthew 25, verse 14, it starts off, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted, everyone say entrusted, I think this might be one of the most important words in the parable. He entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. And my youngest child would say, that's not fair. Uh, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, and then he left on his trip. Now, it's an interesting thing in this story and this idea because he entrusts them with what's his, he gives them something to hold on to that is still his. Uh, actually, you know what would be really great right now? You know what I could really use? Like $100. Does anybody here have $100? George does. Oh, yeah, George. Wow. I won't tell Jamie. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you, George. This is $100. Do you, know, do you know why George was so quick? and happy to give me this $100? We have no idea. Thank you. <laughs> because I gave it to him before service, and I said, hey, in like 20 minutes, I'm going to ask for $100, and I need you to give it to me. When I gave him this money, he knew that it wasn't his, and he knew that I was going to ask him for it later. And I think that there is this reality for every single one of us that we need to come to grips with that the things that we have are not ours. They are entrusted to us by God. And sometimes we get our perspective twisted because we work. We do work. We work a lot of hours. Some of us work too many hours. We work hard. We save. We plan. We prepare. And so we have this perspective that if it's in my hand or if it's in my account, then it must be mine for me to use as I want. And how dare God ask me to be generous to that family that's in need? or to support this organization, or to show up and volunteer on my one day off a week that I have. We get this perspective twisted that we start to think that it's ours, and then when God asks us to do something with what he's entrusted us with, it causes us frustration, pain, grief. We get annoyed, skewed perspective, but it was his all along. The master didn't give these bags of silver to them. He loaned uh, or he entrusted it to them. It's his, not theirs. And if they don't understand who owns what in this parable, it's not going to make sense. And for a lot of us, if we don't understand who owns what in our lives, our lives will also not make sense. We will continue to be frustrated and disillusioned with the realities we need to recognize that God is entrusting us with everything that we have. These people, here's what they do in Matthew 25, verse 16. It says, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Called them to account is an ancient biblical way of saying, where's my money at? What'd you do with my money? It's this way of saying, hey, I've entrusted you something. You knew that you were holding on to it for a little while for me. Now, where is it? What have you done with it? Not... What would you have done with it if you had gotten more? Not what would you have done with it if you had gotten five bags like the first guy? Not what are you planning to do with it or what did you think about doing if, with it, but what did you actually do with what you have actually been entrusted with is the question that this master is asking. 
The servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. And the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, which is interesting. Five bags of silver is a small amount in this master's perspective. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The same thing happened with the second uh, servant. He comes back with his bags of silver and he had doubled it. And so the master gives the two who invested what they had been entrusted with, he gives them even more. Because apparently this master has even more to give. It's a place of sufficiency, not a scarcity. Then in verse 24, it says, Then the servant with one bag came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? So at least I could have gotten some interest on it. Now, it's interesting because for a number of decades of my life, because I grew up in church and I've heard these parables over and over again, I was always like, why does, this, why does this parable explain God as harsh and taking what's not his? That's a weird way to explain God. Like, why would Jesus tell the, <laughs> like, this story? But that's not actually who the master is. That's who the servant imagines the master is. That's the servant's perspective of who the master is. His perspective is his fear or his concern is that the master is this certain way. And I, I don't know for sure. I wasn't there when Jesus said it. But I would imagine, I like to imagine Jesus saying, well, if you knew I was so harsh, <laughs> then why'd you, why didn't you do anything? You could have at least put it in the bank. If, if this idea is actually accurate, then it still would have moved you to do something. Jesus, God, the master in this parable, he's not upset that the person did something wrong. He's upset that they didn't do anything at all. They didn't do anything at all. How many of you guys know that you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right? You cannot break any rules. You cannot sin. You cannot... Uh, mess up, and you can still not do anything right. This, as you look at this idea of who Jesus was talking to and why the religious leaders in that day were so upset with him and frustrated by him is because they followed all of the rules. They never broke the rules. They did the things they were supposed to. They didn't do the things that they weren't supposed to. And that meant that they were okay. They were in. They were at the top of the pile. They were the best of the best. And Jesus says, look, you're like whitewashed tombs, is one of the things he says to him. He says, you're doing nothing wrong, but your hearts aren't right. You're not doing anything wrong, but you're also not doing anything right. Uh, this is essentially the entire premise of the final episode of Seinfeld, by the way. Spoiler <laughs> alert for any Seinfeld fans in the room. It's a sense of, well, just because you didn't do anything wrong doesn't mean you didn't, or that you, you did something right. And the point of our faith, the point of following Jesus, the point of being saved and experiencing grace and God's love and goodness, it's not just to avoid doing wrong things. I think it's a very elementary way of understanding what it means to follow Jesus. And it might be, in, in some ways, it might be good for, for, for children, for young kids to understand that perspective of, here's one of the ways that I show God uh, that I love him, that I want to follow him, or, you know, we, we kind of simplify things down to this idea of, well, just don't do anything wrong, but that's not the, the truest picture of what it means to, to follow Jesus, to believe in a heavenly Father who is full of love and compassion and grace and gives. Life is about actively doing the right things. It's about more than consumption and comparison. It's about contributing. It's about leveraging what God has given you to better the world around you. So the master speaks to this third servant and says, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have 
will be taken away. Now, here's one of the things that we need to know about parables. Um, it's helpful for us to ask the question, whenever we read a parable in the Bible, whenever Jesus is telling these parables, it's helpful for us, for us to ask the question, who is God in this parable and who am I in this parable? And I can tell you who God is in this parable. But each of us as individuals, we have to wrestle with the answer to which, which person am I in this parable? Which servant am I in this parable? God is the master who owns everything and entrusts it to us. And so do we, do we live in an awareness of this reality? Who is it that we are in this parable? Until you understand that God is the owner and you are a steward, you will be annoyed with what God asks you to do with what he has entrusted to you because you'll feel entitled to what doesn't actually belong to you. George didn't hesitate. He almost smiled as he was giving me $100 because he knew it wasn't his in the first place. He had such an open-handed approach because he understood that it was going to be asked for at another time. And again, this is not just about money. It is about money, but it's about so much of what God is entrusting us with the positions that we find ourselves in, the influence that we have, the voice that we have, the, the way we show up in our jobs or in our homes or in our communities, the way we use the skills and the passions that God has put inside each of us that are totally unique. What is it for us to recognize that each of these things is entrusted to us by God? And at any moment, he may ask us to, to use, spend, give, or act on what he has entrusted us with, living open-handedly with all that we have because it is not ours to begin with. It is all entrusted to us. I think that I would have probably thought, if I were the one with the least amount, I would have thought, well, of course, the other two feel blessed. They had so much more than I did. But again, the, the blessed life, this idea of a blessed life, it's not based on how much you have, but how you view and what you do with what you have. The reality for each of us is that oftentimes, well, I guess I should, it may not be the reality for you. I should say, the reality for me and the conversations that I've had with my wife is, man, if I had more, I would be so generous. Because we falsely assume that generosity has to do with quantity. We fall into this trap of, man, if, if I had this, then I would. And it's, man, it's such a, a twisted way of, of seeing this. Because this parable has nothing to do with the quantity. It has to do with how we view and what we do with what we have been entrusted. Trusting God in both seasons when we have everything and in the seasons when we are in need. In Proverbs chapter 30, um, there's a couple of verses here. This is the, vo uh, the voice translation, so it's a little bit different, but I, I love the way it says it. It says, eliminate any hint of worthless and deceitful words from my lips. Do not make me poor or rich, but give me each day what I need. It's kind of setting up the spectrum, right? God, I don't want to be poor, <laughs> but also I don't know that I want to be rich. Give me each day what I need for if I have too much, I might forget that you are the one who provides, saying, who is the eternal one? Which is this rhetorical question of, God who? Look what I've done for myself. Look at what I've accumulated for myself. Or if I do not have enough, I might become hungry and turn to stealing and thus dishonor the good name of my God. And the reality for each of us is that we all exist on this spectrum, somewhere of absence and abundance of being in want or having plenty, of having more than enough or needing some help. We all are somewhere on this spectrum. And regardless of where you at, <laughs> where are you at? <laughs> this message is sponsored by Boost Mobile. Uh, regardless of where you are at on this spectrum, it is a difficult thing because it requires us to trust God in different ways. 
It requires us to trust God. Like, like we sang earlier in this song that Jamie talked about, Jaira, it requires us to trust that God will provide what I need because I am in need. And that is a scary and difficult thing. And the action of trusting, it's not just a one-time thing, but it's an ongoing learning and process and journey of trusting God when I am in need. And on the other end of the spectrum, this idea of I have so much, I have to continue to trust that God is my priority. I have to continue to trust that it is all entrusted to me from God in the first place. I have to continue to trust that I can give generously and I can live generously and I can serve generously and I can think about this way in a different, uh, think about my stuff in a different perspective because of who God is. Both ends of the spectrum, God calls us to sacrifice something that for most of us, it just comes down to this idea of comfort and control. So what does it look like for us to acknowledge where we are at on the spectrum and recognize that it's not getting more that will allow me to trust God. It's not that getting more will allow me to be generous, but where I am at now, I can trust and I can shift my perspective of what I have. Paul, I'll close out with this idea, but Paul talks about this, giving us kind of instructions on how to strengthen that trust, and regardless of which end of the spectrum you are on. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul wrote a letter, and he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Many of us may be familiar with this last line, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But it's important for us to recognize the context of what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about where are you at in life? Are you at a space where you feel like you are in need, where you don't have enough, where you are longing for uh, whatever that thing might be that feels like, man, whether I need this, whether I desire this, are you in the space on this end of the spectrum or are you on this other end where you have plenty? And Paul's talking about how to be content and cultivate this trust in who God is. And he, he says, I can, I can do it all through Christ who gives me strength. I can do this because I can rely on God when I am in need. I can trust that he is my provider. I can do this because I can rely on God when I have plenty and I can live generously and give uh, generously because I know that God will continue to care for me in these ways. Trust is a, a byproduct of ongoing discipline. It's not about a single decision that we make. The reality is it's possible to be truly blessed in a season in which you actually have the least because we're willing to see and steward all that we have as if it were God's because it is. And when we acknowledge that he has entrusted it to us, we get to live with this openness and this reliance that says, okay, it's all from you in the first place and I'm gonna continue to trust that you will provide me with what I need in each moment. There's a, uh, an ancient blessing. Um, it was one of the first blessings that God instructed the priests to speak over Israel. And I just thought it was a, a fitting thing for us to talk about this when we start talking about this series called Blessed and what does it mean to be blessed. And, and we kind of swing a little bit in our minds towards money. And I think part of that is just because of the nature of where we're at in the timeline of the world and humanity and, and all the different external factors. But there is this ancient blessing, a priestly blessing. Some have called it the sixfold blessing. Um, and it's actually, I think it's kind of a funny little twist. Uh, I don't know if there's any Star Trek people in the world out there, but uh, I grew up watching Star Trek uh, pretty much every night. We would sit down and watch Star Trek. And one of the primary characters in Star Trek is Spock. And Spock does this thing where he holds up his hand and he says, does anybody know what he says? Live long and prosper. Live long and, prosper. and what I learned over the last couple of weeks is that this 
hand signal and this phrase is something that Leonard Nimoy, who played the character of Spock, he, Spock, he grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home, and he was very familiar with this sixfold blessing. And at the time when God instructed them to do this, and then in years past, the way that priests would give this blessing to people is that they would put their hand in a symbol of the, the Hebrew letter shin, which is the first letter of the word shalom. Shalom means peace and harmony, prosperity and tranquility. And it, for lack of better words, it, it kind of looks like this. But they would put their hands in this position, meaning it's a symbol of peace and prosperity and harmony and tranquility. And then they would speak this blessing, and there's six phrases in it. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And so the priests, whenever they were speaking to the people in Israel, they would hold their hands out in this way and they would say these words over them. And it's important to note that it has literally nothing to do with bank accounts. It has nothing to do with how much you earn or how much you have. And it's not some sort of... uh, it's not a, a spell or an incantation. Halloween is over. <laughs> it's not like if you say these words, it will be true. What's important for us to recognize is that it's already true. And they would say these words, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. I think as we hold on to this, and as we embrace this reality, we become familiar with the truth that we are blessed, because that the very core of being blessed is a promise of God's presence, that he is with us, that he is in us. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, um, there's seasons of each one of our lives where it feels like it is uh, it's difficult to understand um, how we could be blessed. There are seasons of each one of our lives where we wrestle with the possibility that um, we have enough, that you have entrusted us with exactly what we need for this moment. Uh, there's other times in our lives when we feel like maybe we, we do have enough, maybe more than enough. We've experienced some success and we start to feel safe or comfortable or privileged or whatever the word is that comes to mind. And regardless of where we find ourselves on this spectrum, what we are being called to experience is this truth that being blessed has nothing to do with how much we have, but how we view and what we do with what we have, with what you've entrusted us with. And so God, I pray that this morning that each one of us, myself included, every one of us would invite you to change our perspective, to recognize that being blessed isn't about quantity, it's not about stuff, it's not about uh, numbers or position or accounts or whatever it might be. We can experience goodness in those moments, but those things alone cannot help us recognize that we are blessed. Those things alone, just like the rich young ruler found out, do not fill that craving that we have. It's only in you, God. And I pray that we would become aware of that. We would become aware that you are the source of life, that we are blessed because you look and shine your face on us. You keep us close to you. You are with us in the challenges and on the mountaintops. It is your presence that is offered to each one of us that causes us to be blessed because the master that we serve is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Every one of us can rely on you as our provider. 
So God, I pray that this morning you would help us start to shift our perspective. You would help us start to shift our understanding of what does it mean to be blessed. That it's not something that we will feel once we get to a certain place, but it's actually something that we can embrace today. And it's a way that we can live today. It's a way of being open-handed and saying, God, I'll do my best with what you've given me and I'll follow your direction. God, I pray you would give us the courage to live this way. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.